Good morning. Today's topic is friction and lubrication. You get five seconds to giggle now. Very good. All right, this is chapter 18. And while many of you have seen friction before in the case of uh, of frictionless surfaces, coefficients of static and kinetic friction that you might remember from first semester of, of physics. Today we are going to talk about the molecular basis of friction. And some of you may be a little bit disappointed in that there's no law that accounts for all friction phenomena because we really have to find a way to encompass things like single crystals fricting past each other, not a word, and also sandpaper, which clearly is going to have a different scale and mechanism of friction, but there are some similarities. And the purpose of, uh, of today's lecture is to give you a general framework to think about how these phenomena are studied. Friction is supremely important. You ever think about how profound that statement in most physics uh, one um, problems are that says uh, is that says consider a frictionless surface what if it was not a frictionless surface if this floor were anything but exactly parallel to the tangent of the earth's surface at this point I would slowly be drifting away there would be no movement uh, there would be no intentional movement there would be no standing still, at least on the ground. You need, you need friction. This is, I have not overcome, the gravitational force has not overcome the coefficient of static friction because I'm standing still. Okay. No discussion of friction is complete without a little bit of a review of, uh, of kinematics, but before that, we will just, uh, just introduce this topic a little bit. Lubrication is really the reduction of friction through various uh, mechanisms. First thing to notice is that there is no force law. There's no F equals MA of friction. It arises as a reaction. to motion or another force. There are other forces that have this characteristic, like viscous forces. You put your hand in a, a bucket of water and, or a pool, and it's just sitting there, but then there's a force against your hand as you move your hand. So viscous and hydrodynamic. Forces have this characteristic also as reaction forces. The friction force is non-conservative. It means that it, the, total, uh, the total energy dissipated will be dependent on path. You can't go backwards on a surface that you're dragging your finger across and recover all of the energy. It's, it's gone. It's non-conservative, so this is, uh, means we have energy loss or dissipation. by the uh, transfer of me 
mechanical uh, energy to heat. So let's consider some billiard balls colliding, because in physics we like to talk about billiard balls colliding. And we're going to uh, first talk about two billiard balls colliding, then one billiard ball colliding with a bunch of billiard balls, then one billiard ball colliding with a surface made of billiard balls. And that will be our model of, of friction. This is actually uh, a, at the beginning of chapter 18, there's a, uh, a reference to chapter two, the end of chapter two, which we didn't cover when we covered chapter two. It's about uh, the kinematics of, of billiard balls, but I'll just give you the kind of the, uh, the gold coins. So co let's consider two different billiard balls, and I've drawn them as two different sizes, but they need not be. And they're traveling, or one has, uh, has mass um, uh, little m and initial velocity uh, v naught. The other one has mass big M and initial velocity big V naught. If they collide after the collision, we have a new V1, uh, which is, the, uh, which is the, vel the velocity after the collision of the small billiard ball equal to small m minus big M over small m plus big M times little v naught plus two big M v naught over little m plus big M. I can't say big M without reminiscing that that was the name of the supermarket in my hometown. So consider the following scenario. If the first ball loses all its kinetic energy to the second, then we have That is to say, v1, little v1 equals zero, no kinetic energy by 1 half mv squared. Then we can say that the initial uh, velocity of the big ball, big v0, uh, is big M minus little m quantity times little v zero over two big M. And if big M equals little m, big V naught equals zero, that is two equal two equally sized billiard balls. And we consider the before state Then the collision state. Then the scenario where V1 equals zero and the second ball takes on a velocity big V1. 
There are some nice little uh, animated, interactive animated things that you can Google that various physics uh, professors have posted, where you can play with the, uh, with the relative velocity of billiard balls and watch them bounce around and transfer their kinetic energy. And then we have various limits. If big M is massive compared to little m, that is very big compared to little m, then we have v naught, uh, big V naught equals one half little v naught. If, uh, however, big M is much, much less than little m, then big V naught equals minus little m little v naught over to big M. How about the energies? How do the energies change before and after collision? So the kinetic energy of first ball after after the collision is one half m little m little v1 squared equals one half little m little v naught squared minus two little m big m little v naught squared over little m plus big m squared, or if we do some algebra, we have one half little m little v naught squared times this, uh, this quantity one minus the ratio big M over little m over one plus the ratio big M over little m. squared. And what if we wanted to calculate the fraction the fraction of the kinetic energy transferred from the first ball to the second ball? Then we have the fraction is equal to one minus one half m little little m little v one squared over one half little m little v naught squared equals four big M over little m over the quantity one plus big M over little m quantity squared. Now what does this look like? This is the fraction of the kinetic energy transferred from the first ball to the second ball. Plot. This is the fraction of kinetic energy from first to second ball.
from 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1.0. Zero point oh one, zero point one, one. This is a semi log plot, ten and a hundred. And this plot has to look something uh, like this, where we have. Uh, 100% of the kinetic energy passed from the first ball to the second ball if the ratio between the masses is one. In other words, if they're the same, then they will, uh, then they'll be, um, then all of the, all of the kinetic energy will be, will be transferred. Okay, now what's cool about this is that it, it makes no difference if there's any compressibility. It has to be, it has to be uh, it has to be a purely elastic collision. But the deformation or compression Of, of the ball is unimportant. Now from this analysis, we could, but we're not quite going to calculate because it's complicated, but you can do this using various computational tools online. You can watch a billiard ball collide into a group of billiard balls and then watch them take on various kinetic, kinetic energies. This is in different motions, different random motions. So this is a dissipation process where we have all of the energy embodied here and we're transferring it to all of these modes of motion in all of these other uh, billiard balls. So this is a dissipative process in molecules In molecules and solids, the kinetic energy uh, becomes uh, heat, rotation, rotational and vibrational motion, and increased Entropy. If you queue up the pool balls enough times and you scatter them around, eventually you will cause heat death of the universe. Where everything is, entropy is maximized everywhere and there's no potential differences anywhere to be found, no potential differences in temperature, no potential differences in chemical potential. Everything's the same everywhere. Anyway, chilling vision of things to come. Okay, now how about spheres colliding on a surface? So really, we can think of the atoms in our feet as the billiard balls colliding with the racked up billiard balls that is this uh, that is this floor connected to 
the Earth. So all of this, all of my kinetic energy is being transferred into these vibrational and, and, uh, and uh, kind of disordered modes in the floor, and then it's being dissipated, uh, never to be recovered. So uh, the hard sphere uh, model, in order to, to, to connect this to intermolecular forces, we need the kinetic part, but we also need to introduce intermolecular forces because we know that there's some van der Waals force that attracts these, that attracts my feet to the floor, that attracts any uh, object um, acting on any other in a, uh, in a, in a, in a circumstance that produces uh, friction. So it doesn't account for uh, for what happens after the collisions, like we don't really care where those billiard balls go. We, have, we haven't introduced that into the theory. It doesn't account for nonlinear force laws um, like the van der Waals force, which goes as one over r to the sixth, and it doesn't account for attractive forces. So let's uh, introduce this model called the Coulomb friction model. And imagine a surface that has semi, um, that has hemispherical relief structures as you might have in a single crystal of a metal or something. Single crystalline uh, solid. And imagine a single spherical atom sitting on top that I'm going to move this word friction over here. I've just cut and pasted it manually. That is sitting a uh, distance D away from the surface. That is the center of the hemispheres to the center of the, uh, of the molecule on the surface. The surface has lattice spacing lowercase delta. And let's move this sphere some distance x to from the valley of the from from the valley of, of this relief structure to the uh, to the top of the relief structure and as we do that we're going to create this distance small d, which is the dilation. So the dilation implies that any time you take two surfaces across, or two surfaces, and you apply some shear force to them to get them to move across in, uh, one another, they have to increase their separation from each other by some height in order to overcome the, uh, in order to overcome the fact that these physical asperities are actually what's blocking progress. Now, in a real surface, like a real macroscopic surface like sandpaper, like sandpaper on sandpaper, those asperities will, will rub off eventually, but they're with each but then, but then you, so you'll have a dilation due to the sand, and then you rub it all off, then you'll have a dilation just due to the paper. There will always still be some, uh, some dilation. So we're going to apply a lateral uh, force, or parallel force. This is the so this is getting a little, a bit of a sloppy diagram here. This is the uh, lateral or shear or 
or shear force. And there's also a downward uh, force, F perpendicular, which is the normal force. due to uh, adhesion or externally applied like the gravitation force so just the force of us standing on the ground. If the force is, is sufficient, so in some cases you might go just to just the next valley, and then the next valley and the next valley. Really that's as smooth a force, as a smooth a motion as we can possibly expect given atomically flat surfaces, or where the two surfaces move from one uh, since, they're, since they're commensurate, they go from one notch to the next. And that's the smoothest sliding we can possibly expect to achieve. Sometimes you can have a motion that overcomes multiple potential energy minima, and you can skip over a few lattice sites, and you can crash land, like over here. and you might have an impact. And we can define um, a quantity epsilon as the fraction of the kinetic energy of the top molecule acquired by the surface. acquired by the surface. So what we need to do to initiate motion is apply a force. So force must be applied to the system to overcome forces that oppose dilation. How many of you remember the classic first semester physics problem where they have the skier on a slope and you keep increasing the height of the hill until eventually they slide down the hill? Does anyone remember what the relationship was between the uh, between the parallel force and the the weight of the and the and the force due to the skier um, that depended on the angle the angle uh, theta the uh, the fraction by which the um, the parallel force must be greater than the than the uh, than the downward force is actually equivalent to tangent of theta the angle of the hill. So the force, uh, the, the, um, the lateral or shear force equals F parallel tan theta between the, uh, the two forces. And this equals, we usually call tan theta mu sub s times the, um, times the parallel force or times a perpendicular force. And mu sub s is the static coefficient of friction And what it is is the factor by which the lateral force must be larger 
than the normal force in order to initiate motion. Start motion. Now that's just the, the kinematic part. We also need to consider the adhesion. So we must add contribution from the van der Waals force so we can just write F uh, parallel equals mu sub s f perpendicular plus sigma a where we call mu sub s f parallel the load controlled portion and sigma a the adhesion controlled portion where the intermolecular forces come through uh, via this sigma parameter which is the shear stress produced by intermolecular forces and it has units of force per unit area and A is the area proportional to the number of bonds Broken. So the number of Van der Waals bonds uh, that are broken. So whether the motion continues depends on how much energy there is left over after these collisions. So whether the motion continues depends depends on the fraction uh, epsilon on what fraction of the kinetic energy of the molecule on top is transferred. So we usually, uh, we usually, once the object is in motion, we use a different, uh, we use a different coefficient of friction called the kinetic coefficient of friction. So mu sub s 
is greater than or equal to the kinetic coefficient of friction. And it's always less than or equal to the static coefficient of friction because, uh, because the dilation has already been overcome and we are changing, sometimes we're changing the surface as it goes. So this is, this is why this is a kind of a, a real topic. There's no law like what's the friction of chalk moving on a chalkboard? Well, it depends on the fact that the interface is not really static chalk and static board. We're actually depositing chalk on the chalkboard as we go, which is not really considered here. <laughs> um, and the same thing is true with engaging with a surface. You know, our sweat is being deposited on a surface as we, as we explore um, a surface and skin cells and all that other stuff. So uh, let's look at some real materials and some static and kinetic coefficient of, fri of friction and just talk in a qualitative sense about why, uh, why we observe uh, what we observe. So we'll say material one, material two, mu sub s, mu sub k, and comment. How about aluminum? Interacting with aluminum. So take two aluminum solid blocks and you slide them past each other. Coefficient of static friction, 1.5. Coefficient of kinetic friction, almost the same, uh, 1.4. Now by way of comparison before we comment, let's look at, at aluminum now interacting with steel. Do we think the friction will be lower or higher, given this argument? Anyone want to I heard higher. Why higher? Because two different materials. The radiant of friction will be different on both the materials. But in this case, if we have two surfaces that are the same, we'll have perfect commensurability and they, would, they might lock together more. So it's actually going to be less, 0 0.6, 0 0.5. Generally having two of the same material um, coming together and, and sliding will give you a fairly high, uh, fairly high friction coefficient. So we say incommensurability might be the longest word I've written on this chalkboard of two different metals. Commensurate surfaces lock up. How about gemstones like sapphire? Sapphire and sapphire. Anyone know what sapphire is? Aluminum oxide. Mineral known as corundum. All right. Coefficient of static friction here for 
peroxides is going to be lower because they don't have metallic bonds, the, the propensity to share electrons across interfaces. We have 0 0.2 and 0 0.2. How about diamond and a metal? Turns out to have a very low uh, coefficient of friction and I was not able to find the kinetic uh, coefficient of friction. Uh, crystalline oxides have uh, weak intermolecular forces and also tend to be smooth. That is weak intermolecular forces if they're not already covalently bonded. Now if they were exactly, if you had two crystalline surfaces lined up exactly, would it still be 0.2 and 0.2? Remember our Jolly Rancher example? <laughs> Probably not. These are very practical numbers. These are like machinists numbers, right? Like practical numbers that are actually gonna give you the result that you want in some big engineering project as opposed to um, as opposed to measuring very minute forces in the lab about rubber versus solids of any kind uh, high or low friction rubber with anything high Static coefficient of friction, one to four. One might be something like a hockey puck. Hockey puck is a piece of hard, disc of hard rubber. And this might be silicone. And this is so variable, who cares what the kinetic coefficient of friction is. So while rubber has low adhesion energy, like rubber generally has a high contact angle, why would it give you a, so weak intermolecular forces with the outside world, why would it give you a high kinetic coefficient, or why would it give you a high friction coefficient? Because the contact area, because the integrated contact area, if you have rubber, which, is, which is, has a viscous component to its mechanical properties, the rubber will seep into the asperities in an opposing surface, and it will have a large integrated area, and therefore a large absolute um, resistance against shear uh, motion, which is why tires are made of rubber and not sapphire. That's the only reason. The only reason. So we have low adhesion energy, but conforms to the asperities. How about Teflon versus Teflon? Teflon versus metal. Graphite versus graphite. And graphite versus steel. So Teflon has a very low, uh, a, a low surface energy, one of the lowest surface energies of any solid material. And when it interacts with itself, um, it, it, because it has such a low, uh, a low surface energy, we have, 
0. Uh, sorry, 0 0.08, 0 0.08, and 0 0.08. 0, 7. Teflon also has poor cohesion between Teflon and Teflon chains. So Teflon chains will, will peel off of a surface and deposit on another surface. And Teflon is often used for lubrication uh, between uh, joints for this purpose. And if we have Teflon on metal, some of the Teflon will come off and actually uh, still give you a fairly friction-free surface, 0 0.1 to 0 0.3, 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 uh, kinetic. So once you, get, uh, once, you get, once you get going, you've already kind of deposited the material on the other surface. It sort of just keeps, sort of just keeps going. Graphite has a similar, uh, so, the, so graphite is, um, is layers of carbon sheets. It's like layers of graphene sheets. Now graphene sheets, when you stack them on top of each other, don't have very strong uh, uh, intermolecular forces. It's easy, to, um, it's easy to, to apply a shear stress to get the, the sheets to split uh, apart, and that's what happens in a uh, in lubrication as well. So graphite actually um, slides not only past itself, but it deposits on another uh, it deposits on another material. Then you have another graph uh, graphite graphite interface. So actually, graphite and graphite and graphite and steel both have the same static coefficient of friction because you you really have the same interface in both scenarios. Like take a pencil which has a graphite tip and you slide it across the surface, you're actually sliding across graphite because the first layer of graphite is sticking to the surface irretrievably and then the, what's moving is actually a graphite surface on a pre-deposited graphite surface. And we don't have data for the kinetic coefficient. So graphite and Teflon transfer uh, material to surfaces as they rub against them. Okay, one more. Ice, ice, baby. In five more years, I'm giving it. That joke will make absolutely no sense. Ice and uh, metal. So ice is unique in that the top surface of ice is melted a little bit. So what, you're, what you really have is not a friction scenario like this, but a lubricated viscosity scenario where we're actually, we're actually, we have a scenario in which we have a thin layer of liquid water between the surface that's pressing against it and the, uh, and the, uh, and the ice. So we don't have these locked up surfaces, we actually have a liquid layer, and the liquid layer has some viscosity which allows sliding, as in uh, two scenarios, as in ice skating, and also when you drop a ice cube on the floor and you accidentally kick it and it skids all the way to the other side of the room, whereas if you were to drop any other cubic shaped object it would not have the same behavior. Okay, so the uh, coefficient of friction for ice and ice, 0 0.1, 0 0.03, and ice on metal, 0 0.01, and 0 0.0, There is 0 0.0, 0 0.02 and 0 0.01.
So one to two monolayers um, are liquid. One to two monolayers of ice are liquid. More if there's pressure. So all this business about commensurability of surfaces doesn't quite work. This is like, like um, where you apply a thin film of, of water for like shaving or something. Now our experience of friction is seldom just, just some smooth sliding of lattice sites over other lattice sites. For example, we often have a stick-slip phenomenon, which is uh, a periodic change in, uh, in the force due to sliding because as we slide our finger across, say, a wine glass, there's little bits of stick slip behavior that correspond to some frequency, which sounds like this resonant sound to our ears. It's also the chirping of crickets. It's also the sound of a violin, uh, the stick slip uh, friction that gives us signals in the, audi uh, in the audible uh, frequency. So these are, this is a category called uh, non-uniform friction. And we can think of it in relation to smooth sliding as being a stick slip of friction. And the way that stick slip friction is measured in the lab is to have a substrate with some roughness. A substrate, a slider, a spring, with force constant K and a drive that is also uh, the force gauge. Travels um, at some velocity V and measures friction, force, F parallel prime. So F parallel prime is the friction force that's measured at the drive. And what's gonna happen, and let me, let me uh, label a few more of these aspects. So we have a contact area Contact area A, 
we have the uh, film thickness D, which is really just the separation of the surfaces measured at the measured at the right below the asperities. We have surface energy gamma for unlubricated. surfaces or we have the film viscosity if it's some like oil or something in between the surfaces given by eta kind of this pretty n looking thing Okay, now what's gonna happen as we slide the drive past? You can do this at home actually with, you know those scales that just have a spring in them? So you measure your apples and it's just a scale and it's just a spring inside a, a thing and it goes down to however many pounds weight it is. If you take one of those things and you put a brick on it and you drag it across the ground and the, the what's going to happen is you'll get to some some elongation of the spring and then the brick will move forward a little bit then it'll move forward again and it'll move forward again now there are three different scenarios that might happen in this situation suppose that the surfaces were perfectly commensurate on the molecular scale with each other and you dragged it a little bit and then as soon as you overcame the uh as soon as you overcame the static coefficient of friction, the brick would just move along with the, uh, with the spring. So that's smooth sliding. That's, well, so I, I erased the, the drawing, but that's like going over one atom at a time, perfectly commensurate surfaces. That's as smooth as it possibly gets um, in an unlubricated, for unlubricated sliding. In the case of stick slip, we might have a scenario where we're dragging the, dragging the, the drive along and the brick moves like this. That's called stick slip friction, where we've, where we've kind of overshot the potential energy, we've overshot the potential energy of many lattice, lattice sites in a row, and then we kind of get to some, some new static position from which we need to dislodge the brick again. Another scenario could be, what if you have some really viscoelastic uh, lubricant in between the two surfaces? And as you drag the, the spring, the brick moves forward, but then it moves forward too much and it goes back. And then it moves forward and goes back a little bit. And then it moves forward and the spring, is, so it kind of overshoots, the spring pushes it back. So you get this motion, how's that go again? I can't really pantomime it so well, but you kind of kind of get the idea. It's not quite stick-slip friction because it doesn't actually stick anywhere, it just slides back and forth. So what do these scenarios look like if we plot the force? So this is the force measured at the um, the force measured at the drive. And this axis will be T, time. I don't think we've ever used a time axis in this class, but there it is. So uh, at the beginning, we're stuck. But at some point, we'll call this point A. We're gonna start at point E. Sorry, E stands for equilibrium. We start at point E, we're gonna go up to point A, and at point A, a few different things can happen. In the case of smooth sliding, and assume that our grocery, our farm market scale, was sensitive enough to measure the forces due to single molecules. <laughs> That's what we would see.
we'll label this uh, point B. So this is smooth sliding. Now a stick slip slide, a stick slip uh, pattern might look like this. Or maybe we skip a few molecular asperities, or skip, skip two, say. We skip over one, then we get stuck in another rut. Then we have to apply some more force to get the force back up to the, uh, back up to uh, matching the static coefficient of friction to initiate motion again, and then we fall down again, then we go back up, and we fall down again, and we go up, and we fall down again. This is called stick-slip motion. And this sawtooth pattern is characteristic of stick-slip stick -slip motion. In an ideal case, it's periodic like this, and it gives us a nice violin tone. Um, if it's not so regular, it might sound like nails on a chalkboard. Should I do that? No, okay. Okay, so the final scenario might look like this where we have oscillatory behavior. And this is with highly lubricated surfaces of, of certain types, like a really viscous, really highly viscous lubricant is what produces an oscillatory behavior. Okay, what is, so this is the energy, this is the force versus time. What does the, uh, what does the potential energy landscape for this scenario uh, look like? So we will consider the lattice spacing This is the lattice spacing along the x-axis. And previously we'd used, uh, the, so the lattice, so the, the x-axis is the number of, uh, of lattice sites. So x equals two is, we've used two, two lattice sites. So we'll go from zero to 28, 14 will be in the center. And we'll, uh, we'll draw two, uh, two plots here. The first one is the intermolecular potential. I think there are less than 28 there, but please go with me uh, on this. This is the intermolecular potential in the x direction per molecule. And it has the form E of X equals E naught sine 2 pi X over delta. And we'll set this arbitrarily uh, equal to, uh, to zero. Now this, the y-axis is the potential energy axis in units of the Boltzmann constant 
times t, so in units of kt. And we're going to draw another plot. And the other plot that we're, that we're going to draw is the potential energy of the intermolecular forces plus the potential energy due to the spring. Now, a spring has what kind of potential function? A parabolic potential function as a function of stretching. So the, uh, the, the addition of a para parabolic potential energy function plus the, this oscillatory intermolecular potential function is going to give us something that's really hard to draw accurately. Can you pretend that there are the same number of oscillations in here as there are here? This is the spring potential energy function. Total a parabolic spring potential energy plus the intermolecular potential. E to the uh, e, uh, sorry, e of x equals n e naught sine two pi x over delta plus one half k the spring constant times the displacement squared. So what this is actually, this plot is really e to the, or sorry, I keep saying that, e of x over n, because it's per molecule. So this is the number of molecules in the contact area. Okay, so I've labeled these points. Um, oh, well, Sorry, if you look up for a second. This point down here, this is our D point. Okay, so where do A, B, C, D, and E map to the potential energy surface? How do we think about this? So as we stretch the spring out, stretch, 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 doesn't matter what way we, what, what way we go, but we'll say it's in the, uh, we'll say it's in the, in this direction. So stretch the spring out, we increase in potential energy due to the, uh, due to the spring, and say we get to some point A. Now once we stretch out the spring and we get to point A, we have a few options of where we can go. If we go just one lattice site, that corresponds to, uh, to B. We could also slip and go down to C and get stuck there until we have to drag the, uh, drag the roller coaster train up the lift, the, the lift hill again and drop it again. Um, but what if, what if these barrier heights are really small? Uh, what if there was a viscous lubricant in between the two surfaces? Well, then you might have acquired so much kinetic energy here that you travel back up to an equivalent spot up here to D, and then you might go back and forth, and that would produce the oscillatory behavior. So what's E on this diagram is, is down here.
Okay, let's give some uh, some numbers. So. How far to stretch the spring? Slides the uh, the brick, the slider slides down from A when the spring force equals the max friction force or kx equals 2 pi and E naught over delta. And let's just say that E naught equals 1 kBT. The spring constant equals 1 Newton per meter. The lattice spacing equals 0 0.5 nanometers. The area of contact is a 100 nanometer by 100 nanometer square area, which gives us an N of approximately the area over the square of the lattice spacing, which is the area taken up by each lattice site. So if you divide that into the total area, you get approximately the number of, uh, of lattice sites or n equals 4 times 10 to the fourth. And our x, therefore, equals 2 pi n times e naught over the spring constant times delta, or Two microns. So given these, uh, given these values, just chosen totally arbitrarily, you would stretch this particular spring in a very sensitive grocery scale by two microns. All right. How about uh, lubricated sliding? And we're not going to go into too much uh, detail on this because we really, uh, we really don't. Um, it's it's kind of not as interesting or, or, or easy to wrap our head around as, as the uh, whatever. I don't know how, to, how I'm going to finish that sentence. I can basically write uh, how, this, how, you, how you actually deal with this in the lab in like one, one expression. So lubricated, lubricated sliding depends on the molecularity of lubricants for small for small d's but for big in which case it's really complicated but for big d's it's just a viscosity measurement. Suppose we have two plates in our viscometer. We have an area A and a separation uh, D, and we're applying some shear force uh, to it then the tangential uh, force is going to be the, uh, the bulk viscosity eta times the area times the parallel velocity over the distance. And this is the viscous shear force.
shear force. And really, the viscosity in units of Pascal second, this is just a rearrangement of the, uh, of the definition of viscosity, which equals the shear stress over the shear rate, or F parallel over the area divided by V parallel over the distance. And this equals 10 to the minus 3 Pascal seconds for water. But for very thin, uh, for very thin lubricant layers, these mo molecules can actually lock up. And you can get structures that, or you can get uh, profiles, force profiles, that look a little bit like the oscillatory solvation force. Where this is uh, at rest, and these molecules here are ordered. These are sticking, so this is rest. We're applying some stress, and this is sticking, but at some point we're going to overcome this uh, stuck behavior and we're going to liquefy the, uh, we're going to liquefy the lubricant. And whoa, they don't know where they are. The drawings in the book are a little more well rendered than this. But this is a this is slipping. Under stress. I'm totally out of space and almost out of time, so forgive me. Or we can have just one layer slip. Or we can have a slip plane. And the final scenario is Refreezing. When we remove uh, the stress, so this kind of behavior can give you stick-slip uh, behavior as well, but it's not a result of commensurability of the two surfaces. It's actually a result of commensurability of the surfactant of the uh, lubricant molecules. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend.